Welcome to another edition of The Roundtable. My name is Paul Dingelman. Glad that you are along. We are very honored today to have uh, a fellow that's been uh, around uh, the Michigan for, for numbers of years and accomplished lots of things. Mr. David Bonnier is his name. He spent uh, many, many years in uh, Congress of the United States representing uh, the 12th district at the time. Uh, he was in Congress from uh, 13 straight terms from 77 through 2003. And uh, he is now back uh, on a book tour, and we are lucky to have him here. David Bonier, welcome to the, the, the round Thank table you. set. Nice to see you. You had the opportunity today to speak before the St. Clair Rotary Club to uh, rave reviews. They, they liked your speech, and uh, you were here uh, talking about your new book. What's the name of the book, and what's it about? I am here, and thank you. It's nice to be with you, Paul. Thank Thanks you. for having me. It's always great to be here uh, along the river. And yeah, you uh, have many, many wonderful memories I of do. Uh, the river from Algonac up to uh, Port Huron and beyond with the, the Beta Bridge right. trail yeah. and, uh, and uh, handing out trees. Tree. Remember that? Well, my wife and I actually walked the congressional district one time. We walked 150 miles around it. We walked right up the river. We started in uh, New Baltimore down by the lake and we came all the way up and all to Lexington and then we went west and did part of the district. So we, we, we had many meetings here, with many backyard barbecues, wonderful people. The uh, district at the time was called the 12th, yes. and it was northern Macomb, is that right, and, or uh, most no, no, of Macomb? It was uh, two-thirds of Macomb County, okay. and then all of St. Clair, and then I had three townships uh, in, in Sanilac. Oh, okay. And then Fremont, the, Worth, and Buell. Okay, and then the re redistricting came along and, right. and uh, changed that whole thing. So Yeah, well, they, they changed the, the numbers of people in districts based upon the census. and. You know, when you're working on your census and people come by, oh, yeah. they, that's part of the information they need to decide what areas of the country get more Congress people or less Congress people. And so that's changed considerably. When I came to the Congress, I think we had 19 members from Michigan. Now we're down to 14, if I'm not wow. mistaken. So we've lost population, and that's been affected by it. So I wrote this book, because you wanted to know the name of it. Yep. It's called WHIP leading the progressive battle during the rise of the right and it's my 26 years in the u.s congress and uh it's a tale uh, that has some instructive stories in it and some uh, humorous stories and some poignant stories and it's a long book because it's I had a long career the uh the book you talk you were talking in, at rotary about it that there are some rules that that you really went by talk to me about that how you you had five or six rules of... Oh, 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 well, when I was a leader. Leader. Yeah. Well, when I was, I was elected leader of my, my party, uh, the, what they call the whip, the number two position when I was there at the end of the Democrat Party. And uh, uh, one of the things I learned over that period of time, Paul, was that to be a, a good leader, you had to have certain qualities. And uh, one of them is listening. You have mm -hmm. to be a good listener. That's really true. And it's not just a cliche. I mean, if you want to learn about new things and about what matters to your colleagues and what they need, what they want, you've got to listen to them. Then you can lead them. So that was a really key piece of my uh, of what I learned over the years. I, I learned also that you have to have a vision. And you don't learn an, a vision or come up with a vision in Washington, D.C. You come up with it wherever you're from, from St. Clair, from Mount Clemens, uh, or from California or from Florida, wherever it is. And I had a vision. I grew up in a working class family. My father worked as a printer. My f grandfather, who lived with us my whole life, was an uh, auto worker at the Dodge Main plant. Mm. And so my vision was that if you worked hard, you deserve to have support. And so I basically was a kid that was raised on working for economic and social justice and good pay right to organize and to collectively bargain, uh, good health care for your family, and a decent retirement after you gave your family and your community your life's work. And those are kind of the principles that I worked on. Humility was another one that uh, I learned. That in this business, uh, there's enough credit to go around. And don't hog the mic. Don't hog, you know, just share the credit. And that's what I tried to do throughout my career. I worked at that hard. when I. First was elected speaker, 
Thomas, uh, they call him Tip O'Neill. He right. was a legendary speaker yeah, he of the legendary. House. He was, uh, uh, took me under his wing and made me the chair of the task force on Central America. We had war, 10-year war down there at that time. And uh, he was very good about allowing me to help develop the strategy and to be the spokesperson for that for my party. When I came to the Congress in 77, in 78, I formed a group of called Vietnam Veterans in Congress. There were right. 11 of us. And I did the same thing with our group. As the chairman of the group, I, Al Gore got to do the Agent Orange issues that were important to Vietnam veterans. I did, along with Tom Daschle, and a bill that allowed us to have counseling centers located in communities and downtowns throughout the country where veterans could go and get some help from their post-traumatic stress disorder. So spreading it out is good. And uh, so those are some of the qualities. There's, there's some others. Got to have a little luck. Yep. And I got to say, I had my share of luck. I mean, I ran in a district where I had an open seat in 76. That doesn't happen very often. That doesn't happen very often. Very unusual. And so it kind of timing was good. It opened up for me. And then when I got there, we had a, t uh, a when I, well, I shouldn't say when I got there, during the race to get there, we had this terrible storm that uh, had closed down a lot of Michigan. That was an ice storm. Hmm. It was in March 3rd of uh, 1976. And Marine City and St. Clair and all these river towns, Algonac, were, were, had serious problems. I mean, the lights, the power was out. Uh, a lot of the sewer systems weren't working because the power was out. We had 16 people that were killed as a result of this ice storm. It was a huge, huge wow. thing. And so it killed millions of trees. So I was an environmentalist in the legislature. And I put two and two together, and I said, wow, maybe I can replant them. What Great we idea. lost. Found a place that sold me a box of little pine seedlings, and that started us on our road to victory. And when I won the election, the Macomb Daily had a headline, uh, The Road to Washington for Bonyard <laughs> Paved with Pine Seeds. I like it. I like it. Yeah. And you did that for years and years and years, didn't you? Yeah, I did it my whole career. Did it How for, many total uh, careers did you finally? Well, we passed 70,000 out that first campaign, and then every year we would have during the spring and in the uh, fall, we would pass out other pine seedlings. But in between, we would also go to schools okay. and give these trees out and talk about the environment with kids, grade schools, high schools, middle schools. And so the, the answer to your question, we gave a million trees out, over a million trees over the 30 years that I did this. Marvelous. Yeah. Uh, you also were involved in the bridge to bay, or the bay to bridge. Bike trail? Bike, bike trail. Yeah. Well, that was one of the things that came out of the you got to have a vision right. when you're in Congress. And one of the visions I had, I was sitting on top of the uh, fog cutter in uh, Port Huron. And uh, one of the visions I had was to, while I was watching that traffic and not enjoying my food because <laughs> it was packed up all the time. And I said, why don't we just build another span? And we did. Right, right. But, but the bike trail that you raised, but Judy and I, my wife, we walked, as I said earlier, around the whole district. And, we thought, you know, there's a lot of places you, can, you can't walk safely in a neighborhood, right? Correct. And we need to build some bike trails for, 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 for kids and for recreation and for health and all the pieces. So we started a whole series of bike trails throughout the district. Well, they're used. I can see them. They're used in the winter. Good. Uh, yeah. the, the East China Education Foundation I talked about at lunch today had a 5K run at, up in the, by St. Clair Middle School. Yeah. And uh, they used the the, uh, the bike trail mm -hmm. uh, to, for the 5K run, along with a couple of city city streets. But yeah, the cool. DPW had plowed it, and uh, it was in the middle of February, the first weekend in February, and had a good turnout and raised some money, and and uh, it was used. So that's great, even in the winter. That's so. great. That's good to hear. Uh, you were in Congress uh, a long time. Uh, do you think it's a little different now? You know, it's a little different, right? It's different. It's more polarized and uh, there are very few swing districts I my district was a swing district mm -hmm. most thir two-thirds of Macomb and then all of St. Clair it could go either way Democrat Republican and I had tough races all those years there are very few swing districts left in the country maybe 30 35 out of 435 and it's polarized uh, the redistricting have made them either Republican or Democratic heavily so the battles for those districts often occur in the primary, not the general election, which hardens the positions 
of the people who are running and getting elected in those primaries and therefore making it more difficult to get things accomplished in the Congress. I heard somebody the other day on one of the radios or networks or someplace that said, it's so much better to have a swing district because then the candidates have to work harder to talk to the people. Uh, that's and, a good point. Yeah. And, and you know, they, they have to propose what they're actually going to do right. uh, in order to help and support the people. Well, you have to see them. And one of the things, right. we, we had to do that. So one of the things we did was uh, we had these backyard barbecues all the time yep. where we would come and, and be in the backyard for breakfast. We'd start with, a, with a, a little small buffet breakfast before people went to work. This is just in like a three or four or five block area. Mm -hmm. We'd leaf it the night mm -hmm. before, so mm -hmm. let people know we were around. They would come. I would, uh, we'd get a cup of coffee and a donut and juice. Uh, and they, we'd sit and chat, and I'd talk, give them a little, you know, 10, 15 minute chat, uh, speech, and then we'd chat. And, you know, you wouldn't have a lot of people. You'd maybe have 20, 25 people that come, but you know, you do that constantly around the district, and you meet a lot of people, and you learn a lot of things. One of the things I want to tell you real quickly, one of the first bills I ever had adopted occurred at one of these meetings. Somebody told me, he said, you know, uh, what are you going to do about these PCBs? And I didn't know what PCBs were. And I said, what's PCBs? And I learned it was polychlorinated by phenyl since, but I learned that they're dangerous and they're in capacitors on poles in neighborhoods and they're carcinogenic. And that's what caused the problems with reproduction with bald eagles, right. PCBs. Anyway, uh, I investigated it, I looked into it, and I authored the first bill uh, in the state and in the country that uh, prohibited the manufacture, sale, and use of them. And it just came out of a meeting. I, same thing happened on uh, the, the bridge thing. We started to have meetings all over the, along the river here within, in the communities that would be affected. And people s said, of course we, want, we would like another span because we're waiting in line too There's much. Hours. And it's, yeah, we're, we're not getting anywhere. It's inhibiting, pro, uh, uh, it's inhibiting business and pr productive business. But it goes back to your original statement. You were listening. You got to listen, yeah. And uh, people who talk, uh, they're fine. I, and people, but people who listen are, you know, they can be more dangerous or more helpful. One of the questions that came out of the Rotary meeting today mm -hmm. was term limits. What are, what's your thought on that? Well, I originally was always opposed to them because I always thought, well, we all have, we have term limits. Every two years you have to run and get renewed for Congress anyway, or for the state legislature every two years in the House and four years in the Senate. I've sort of changed a little bit over the years. I think that the term limits in Lansing, for instance, for your state reps and your state senators are too short. It's six years and eight years. And that's just too much turnover. Mm -hmm. and, but without term limits, like in Congress, and that's not going to change in Congress because basically you have to change the Constitution. Mm -hmm. That requires three quarters of the states mm -hmm. to it ratify. It's not going to happen. But, but you know, the, you get people that stay there until their 80s and, you know, some until their 90s. And the committee chairman used to be, it's changed a little bit now, they can only stay there each committee chair for six years, which is a good change that they made uh, since I left. But, uh, but anyway, I think we need more refreshing of those institutions, those uh, legislative bodies, and uh, we've got to figure out a way to do that. Um, NAFTA, that was a thing that you opposed uh, with, with uh, bells and whistles and horns and everything you could, and you made quite a statement on the floor of Congress uh, the, the, the vote was up, but uh, what's the opinion of NAFTA now? Well, na we, we've got about $181 billion trade deficit with our trading partners as a result of that annually. Uh, the people who lost their jobs in the auto industry have never really re gotten back that income that they lost. They got right. new, new jobs, most of them, or many of them, but at about a 20% uh, less rate they were earning in the auto indust industry. Uh, it's not been good for workers in Mexico or the United States. In Mexico, the poverty rate has gone up since NAFTA, and the people who worked in those maquiadoras along the border were hoping for a better life, but they really didn't get it. They continue to have huge environmental problems with toxins along mm -hmm. the river, and wages are pretty stagnant there, and a lot of the businesses have since left and gone to Asia. 
Uh, right. It's not really worked out. But the movement we started when we fought against NAFTA in 1993 and came close to beating it, but we didn't beat it, but we formed a movement that stayed alive and really ended up beating the Trans-Pacific Partnership mm. Pact, okay. which was have done the same thing because it didn't include the safeguards on the environment and on, on labor standards that we were, we were asking for. So there's renegotiations going on on the North American Free Trade Agreement right now, and we'll see what, what comes out of that. But uh, uh, it, it costs a lot of heartache and a lot of pain. All you have to do is travel those roads through the industrial Midwest and see those downtowns and main streets, yeah. and they were devastated by yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, you're on a, a book tour. Uh, you're appearing in uh, Port Huron this evening, and uh, yeah. you're, you're appearing down in Macomb County, too. Uh, how can people get a hold of the book? Well, uh, I'm going to be in McMorrin uh, this evening talking, and we, we'll sell the book. The book goes to a charity. It's to the Mikva Challenge. We work with high school juniors and seniors, getting them more involved in civic action in their mm -hmm. community, in their neighborhood, in their schools. That's a great. It's a real, real fabulous program. It's been a 20-year program now and started in Chicago. I've been working with it since 2004, so about 14 years. And we'd like to bring it to Michigan. We have it in Washington, D.C. and Chicago. And uh, we're hoping to raise funds. So I'm giving everything from the book to that particular project, which I've been involved with for a number of years. And that's uh, what I spend my time on now, working with uh, young people in this program. Uh, paperback, uh, is it available on no, Amazon and those kind of places? No, no paperback yet. Maybe at some point. But you can get it uh, at these following bookstores online if you want. You can, you can get it at Powell's okay. Bookstore, Barnes & Noble. And I guess Amazon sells it as well, but uh, Barnes & Noble would be a good place to get it. Or, you, or if you're a local bookstore, you might want to ask them. They can usually get it in the mail quickly, you know, a day and a half. Only 600 pages. You did, you didn't, <laughs> you just, this is the... Uh, the yeah, the, it's, the, a, the, uh, it's long, but I had a long career. And there's some wonderful stories in there, and there's a great index, great table of contents, so you can look through and see what might you wanna, might want to read. You told a story about the getting to know people, and then, then we'll finish. Getting yeah. to know people in Congress, and, and that is not happening now because they're, yeah. not, they're not there. Ta tell that story. Oh, I'll tell that story. All right. Listen, people don't know each other as well. When I came there, people brought their families. We worked four days a week, and, you know, one day for travel. Now they get there on Tuesday and they leave on Thursday, so they're not there long enough, not even to know their staffs well, let alone the other members of the other party. And you have to develop relationships. And so when I was there, we had great relationships when we were off the floor. We had a gymnasium where we would play basketball hmm. every day uh, after work, uh, Republicans and Democrats on the same team. You learn who hogs the ball, right. who's a good sport, right. and you learn who isn't. You know, you learn these pieces, and it's different from the business you're doing on the, on the floor. But you develop relationships with eventually helps you in, in the business. We had an annual baseball game every year, Democrats and Republicans. It's, been, it's an old game. It's been going on for almost 100 years. And we we raised $100,000 for charity at that game. Wow. And I'll give you one example of the significance of how sports can make a difference. Uh, I played shortstop for the Democrats for many, many years. And a guy by the name, uh, uh, I'll just call him uh, Dan from Indiana, a congressman, he played for the Republicans, and one year he got on base and stole second, and he was on second, and he was taking the lead off. <laughs> and I was playing short, and we had to play with the, with the second baseman and the pitcher, where we had signals, and second baseman would release, and then when he released, Dan would take more time, go off the base more, because he thought he was safe, and then I would sneak around and pitcher would time it and throw the ball to me, and I got him out one year. We did this like two years in a row, <laughs> and I got him out. So. One day, I'm on the House floor, and I put money for a bike trail. I don't know if it was the Bay to Bridge Trail. It was one of the trails I was working on, either here or in Macomb County. And it really didn't belong in that bill. And I didn't have a good <laughs> argument to keep it in the bill. And Dan made a motion to strike my amendment on the floor. And I didn't know what to basically say, because he had the better argument. I didn't have the <laughs> argument. So I told his story. I said to the, the people who were on the floor. You on the it. floor, I said, "You know, we were playing baseball, and we were in a game, and I was snuck in behind uh, <laughs> Dan, and I got the ball from the pitcher, and I tagged him out. 
And he was out, but in the process, he stepped on my foot, <laughs> which was true. And he opened up about a three-inch, three-inch scar on my leg, I, uh, my foot, over my right big toe. And I had it stitched, actually, in the dugout because we had doctors there. They had cleaned it and everything. And so I said, you know, uh, I've got that scar on my big toe. And every morning when I wake up, I think of Dan. Right. Because, and when I put on my socks, I see that scar and I think of him. <laughs> and I said, you know, and you know what he's doing today again? He's stepping on my toes again. <laughs> well, he got a big kick out of that and the people who were in the chamber did as well. So when we had a, re a voice vote on that, he didn't even demand a roll call vote. So I, I kept my bike trail, which I could have lost. And it was team and knowing people. It was, no, it was that relationship we had. Putting a little humor to it and, yeah. and uh, just making it happen. Yeah. Dave Bonnier, we appreciate the, all the work you've done for uh, Michigan and for uh, this uh, area over the, all the years. And uh, we wish you all the best. Thank you. It's an uh, Your book is called Whip, Whip. and uh, it's available at uh, Amazon. And uh, that other bookstore was in Washington, wasn't it? Powell's, uh, uh, Powell's yeah. is in, actually in uh, Portland, Oregon, but it's a great bookstore, and they'll get yeah, the book. I've heard the name before. That's get, I... They'll get it to you real quickly, and you can also get it from Barnes & Noble. Good. Thank you for your Paul, time, nice sir. to meet you. That's about it for uh, this edition of uh, The Roundtable. Till next time, I'm Paul Dingaman. See you soon.